Uh, this is for everyone in the room and uh, for you as well, Michael, down in sunny San Francisco. I know we're all jealous. Uh, what can you elaborate on uh, relative to political initiatives throughout the country in regards to the future of the labor organizing efforts? It seems that we're in a new uh, labor movement over the last couple of years, and especially the last year. We're seeing a lot of labor activity. And, you know, as far as these, these ballot proposals go and the general atmosphere during the election and post-election, uh, what, what implications do you think those will have? And where do you think this labor movement is heading? Well, elections matter. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, if, if the president is, uh, is re-elected, uh, if that's what the country thinks is the best thing to do, uh, organized labor is, is going to be insisting, I think, on a, on a huge uh, payoff. Uh, the fact is they didn't get EFCA the last time, um, and so you're going to con continue to see a very active uh, labor board. You'll see the Department of Labor uh, going forward with their new interpretation under their rulemaking approach with respect to Labor Management Reporting Disclosure Act with respect to so-called persuader activity. Um, and I think that, uh, that labor will basically say, quote unquote, uh, we hope this was worth it, but we're going to have to see a huge, huge return on our investment. Um, if, on the other hand, uh, the country decides that, uh, that we need a change, um, uh, I think that that will slow down some of those initiatives, at least for the short term. But the, the, the fundamental fact is organized labor, even though it's down to about 12 percent of 100 and 3 million people or so and 6.9 in the private sector. Um, there are so many millions, if not trillions of dollars with respect to pension funds and other political uh, wealth that they have through hard dollars is also through people power um, that they're still going to be um, a factor in this country. And that's not necessarily all bad because there does need to be a check and balance. And obviously unions back in the 30s and the 40s, I think most people would agree, made a very valuable contribution and can still make a contribution today when employers uh, do not uh, treat their employees correctly. Uh, but I think that the power grab and the uh, and, and some of the things that we've talked about today are, are quite frankly very troubling, and that's why I think that this election um, is extraordinarily important. You know, Michael, I think that it's that that, um, that if you look at even though the the unions, the membership is 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 going down, if you look at the the wealth of the unions. Uh, nationwide, and it and it really hasn't changed all that much over the last ten years. Um, I think I feel that over the last uh, couple of years, and Cliff and myself have discussed this numerous times. They have not really, you know, I mean, I mean they have not really raised a lot of stink over the uh, the non-activity as far as moving forward and, and uh, making changes to labor law, you know, like the like the expedited election. And I think they've been sitting on their hands because I personally I feel that there already is something in the works for after the election. If not, and with all my years of experience, 24 years working on the other side, I know in, in, in working in Washington D.C. And, and around the country, um, I I I know that there would be a a just the just the you know a vocal response. To nothing happened, especially after putting so many hundreds of millions of dollars, and I, I don't think a lot of people realize how much money unions actually put in, you know, for political activity. So, given that, I really believe that there's something in the works that's going to happen after the election, um, it being such a close election, and that's why they're waiting to after the election. But I think I think we're going to see something fairly soon. You know, I, I agree. I agree with that, and, and I think it's you know, so a lot of these things are in the queue, like the LMRDA. You know, the the, the rule has been out there, um, and uh, OMB uh, hasn't gotten it yet. So you know, we're waiting for that. I'm sure that uh, all of these regulatory agencies have basically been told to take a low profile over the last several months, not to create a political issue. Um, so I, I, I think it's fairly clear. Um, as to where all of this is, is going. And, and just to uh, put an exclamation point, it's not only the, the dollars that they have, but it's the number of people, going back to one of the uh, opening points that was discussed, um, you know, you can't get somebody to negotiate a, a collective bargaining agreement. You can't get somebody to process a grievance. You can't get somebody to schedule an arbitration. How come? Because they're out knocking on doors. You know, and all these points kind of lead to the, the bottom line here. How you, you look at the percentage of, of unionized employees go down over years, and I think some like people in labor think it's hit rock bottom in this time. 
but you invest your money and what do you get in your investment? If you take a look at the organizing drives that have gone on over the last 10 years, what's been the byproduct? What's been the byproduct of the millions of dollars that have been invested? It appears that this is what the new investment model has been for the last four years. You know, you have this Labor Management Relations uh, Disclosure Act. It's sitting out there. It's waiting to happen. And Michael, you're right on point. When that happens, it may be a chilling effect on a lot of attorneys, potentially, to want to get on board and, and see what they can do. But more importantly, behind the scenes, if you spend money and you're not hitting a new audience, what are you doing? You're selling the same old product to the same old people. You need new people. So you go ahead and you get a president who puts new people on the National Labor Relations Board. You appoint new judges. You put your money in places that are going to have a long-term effect, and you ultimately get your message out by putting postings on the wall. That's still pending right now. They just, But you put a posting out. People don't even know who you are in some of these states. Some of these industries have never seen who's the NLRB. Who are these people? You go out there, and you have a quick election. So they don't know who you are, but I've seen your letter on the wall, and I don't like what's going on. I call you up. All of a sudden, somebody finds out about this that's a union. They get a quick organizing campaign. You don't have a chance to fight back. If you hire a persuader, you might have to worry about having to pay a heavy fine. Then you're going to start looking at increases in damages now. You're looking at the, the damages now for terminating employees has gone up as far as the calculation of interest. So you do this new organizing effort that has nothing to do with organizing, has nothing to do with anything except for getting your message. And the message seems to be clear. Let's get a broader group of people. Let's go after people who are non-union employers, and let's take a look at their Facebook and their social media policies. Let's go after their at-will policies. Let's look at how they do arbitration agreements. And they have attacked legally so that the footprint of your money is spent better. And I think it's an investment. It's a political investment that's taken a couple years. You didn't see the fast bang that they expected. EFCA didn't work. But there are other ways to get to the pie, and EFCA while probably better than some of these, was only one way to get there. And there's no saying that won't happen. We don't know what's going to happen in a couple of days. We don't know what's going to happen in two years if the current administration continues to be here. But if you do these things administratively and you start changing at the NLRB and you get some judges that agree with you on whether something is possible versus reasonable to say, oh, that's a violation because somebody may potentially think of something, everything you do as an employer is going to be under scrutiny and all of a sudden you're paying money or you're going to trial on the most ridiculous of issues that's the political pressure that's being put right now that I say I mean that's the real political pressure you don't know what you can do right now because you don't know what's going to happen in the future with the current constitution of the board and some of these judges well we don't we don't know a lot of things including what's going to happen with the fiscal cliff um, so there's uh, there's a lot of uncertainty right now, and uh, people can can handle almost anything as long as they know what the what the road is like. But you know, it's the old story: if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. And I think right now, people feel we don't know where we're going, and instead of taking a road, let's just stop. And I think that's where we are. And I think that's one of the reasons why this election is going to go down in history: is the election about jobs. Um, and one of the reasons why the jobs aren't being created is because people don't know where that long-term road is.